national income by £9 billion a year by 2030. Our political correspondent Chris Mason reports. The big Brexit vote is a fortnight away. Suddenly it feels like a general election campaign with one candidate, the Prime Minister, and one policy, her Brexit deal. First stop for her today, Bilf Wells in Mid Wales. I'm here today at the Winter Fair at the Royal Welsh, hearing from farmers, from manufacturers, the importance of the certainty that the deal brings, the importance of the free trade area, of the ability to export, continue to export well with the European Union in the future, that we see in that political declaration for our future relationship on trade with the European Union. But her critics are everywhere. This man, glass of water in hand, used to walk into this radio studio all the time to defend the government. Take a listen to him now. My fear is this de deal actually just gives us the worst of all worlds. No guarantee of smooth trade in the future and no ability to reduce the tariffs that we need to conclude uh, uh, trade deals with the rest of the world. So unless the Commons, I think, can be persuaded somehow that those things are possible, yes, then I think the deal is doomed. And here's the leader of the party that prop up the Conservatives in government. I think the disappointing thing for me is that the Prime Minister has given up and she's saying this is where we are and we just have to accept that. But she may have given up on further negotiations and trying to find a better deal, but I haven't given up. I believe in a better way forward and I believe we must find that. And with friends like that, the Prime Minister could do without what you're about to hear from the President of the United States. Who does he think has won in the negotiation between the UK and the European Union? Sounds like a great deal for the EU, and I think we have to do this. Uh, I think we have to take a look at seriously whether or not the uh, UK is allowed to trade, because, you know, right now, if you look at the deal, they may not be able to trade with us. Downing Street insists an independent trade policy is possible under its plan, but with criticism raining down on the Prime Minister, people on all sides of this debate are now marshalling their arguments hoping that their plan can replace hers if, when, it's defeated. Some passengers say leaving the EU with no deal is fine, reckon Mrs May's vision is the worst deal in history and are not surprised by President Trump's intervention. He's not only pro-British, pro-Brexit, uh, pro-believing uh, that nation-states should make deals together, but right from day one of being elected, he saw a big, all-encompassing trade deal with the UK as being a very important thing. Firstly, for our two countries, and secondly, for him to say to everybody, I'm not protectionist, I believe in free trade when it's between countries that are equivalents. And from those arguing for no deal to those arguing for no Brexit, some young campaigners gathered in Westminster this morning to make their case. If you get the feeling anything could happen in the next few months, you might just be onto something. Chris Mason, BBC News. Well, whilst Theresa May was at Queen's University in Belfast, she gave an insight into her frustration and not being able to keep everyone happy with her Brexit deal. I did express this night. Frustration is just a, um, a sort of comment that I've been through this 18 month negotiation process with people at most of the stages, virtually every stage, saying you won't get a deal, you won't be able to achieve this, you won't be able to achieve, achieve that, you won't be able to achieve the final deal. Now I've got to the final deal, everybody's saying, well, okay, what's next? <laughs> Hmm. Well, let's talk to our chief political correspondent, Vicky Young, who's in Westminster for us. I mean, it, it's a hard sell in every, anybody's terms. Yeah, well, I think she's going to be even more irritated because I think the next two weeks there's going to be lots of people saying that she can't get her deal through Parliament because the numbers and the support uh, doesn't look particularly strong at the moment. So what she's continuing to do is to go around the country and to sell the deal uh, to the public, I presume hoping uh, that businesses and others will put pressure on their MP uh, to get behind her. So, you know, I think that is the strategy. Now, whether it will work or not, there's some MPs uh, already saying, well, you know, her going out and selling the Conservative Party message during the last general election didn't work and they're not that confident that it will work this time around but I think what her point is that she will uh, keep going because she feels she's got the only deal and the best deal that you could have got with the EU because it involves compromise and, and she thinks that the idea you can just start again go back to the EU say give us a better deal that that's just simply not realistic so 
In, let's talk about President Trump, Sir Michael Fallon. I mean, th th these are criticisms that will hurt. Yeah, I mean, I think Sir Michael Fallon, he got up yesterday in the House of Commons and made it clear he wasn't happy. His remarks saying that the UK was effectively handing over £39 billion with absolutely no assurances uh, that there would be frictionless trade or that we would get anything in return. Now, he followed that up today by going on to Radio 4 and not being wholly uh, supportive when it was put to him that Theresa May would have to resign if she loses the vote on the 11th of December. So... Clearly, that isn't very helpful. Uh, and then President Trump suggesting that um, a, an ambitious trade deal between, the, uh, between America and the UK wouldn't be possible because of this uh, Brexit compromise that she's come up with. Well, that hasn't helped either. And I think the point there is that the UK, under the terms of the uh, withdrawal agreement, once we've left a transition period, would be able to sign their own trade deals. Uh, the question is much more about our future relationship. What kind of relationship are we going to have? The one that Theresa May seems to envisage is one where we're quite closely aligned to the EU. And it's almost as if you have to, you have to make a bit of a choice, really, because if you're going to be closely aligned to the EU and their rules and regulations, that's by definition going to limit what you could offer uh, America to make it an attractive trade offer for them. So these are, once again, the trade offs that you have uh, when you're trying to negotiate this kind of deal. But there are plenty of people in the House of Commons uh, who feel that that isn't the way to do it, uh, that the best idea would be to break away uh, more cleanly, if you like, and that would give you more independence. But there's two weeks to go uh, until that vote, and Theresa May will continue uh, to make her case, uh, regardless of the opposition that there seems to be here. Now, that's exactly what I wanted to pick up on, because it's a gruelling week. She had that mauling, many would say, in the, in the Commons yesterday. Prime Minister's questions tomorrow. Then she's got to go to Argentina this week. Yeah, that's right. She's got a G20 summit uh, in Argentina. Um, lots of people have been talking about the Prime Minister's uh, resilience. Now, others would say, well, that is her job. What else is she supposed to do? Uh, and, of course, that admiration from some about her resilience and the fact that she carries on despite the setbacks and never seems to be downhearted about it. Uh, I think that's a sort of personal uh, recognition of her strengths. But there are others who would say, well, that dogged determination has been a problem because they think that she has boxed herself in in negotiations. She's very much made up her mind about what Brexit's about, particularly about end of freedom of movement, uh, about immigration. And they feel that that has limited her somewhat in the deal that she's been allowed to get. So I'm not sure that that personal admiration for her work ethic necessarily will translate into overwhelming support for the deal that she's got. Vicky, thank you very much. Vicky Young there in Westminster. A bus company has been fined more than £2 million after it ignored warnings about a driver who crashed into a supermarket killing two people. The Midland Red bus careered into the Sainsbury's store in Coventry three years ago, killing a seven-year-old boy and a pensioner. The trial heard that the driver, who was 77 at the time, had mistaken the accelerator for the brake. Catherine Stancheshen reports. The moment Kalish Chanda lost control of his double-decker bus, failing to brake, pressing hard on the accelerator instead. Seconds later, it smashed into a supermarket, killing seven-year-old Rowan Fitzgerald, who'd been sitting at the front of the top deck. 76-year-old Dora Hancox, who'd been crossing the road that afternoon, was also killed. The court heard it was lucky more people weren't injured. Kalash Chanda was 77 at the time of the accident and was diagnosed afterwards with dementia. His driving had become increasingly erratic. Mr Chanda had had several previous crashes. There had been repeated complaints by customers and just six months prior to the crash he had been assessed in-house. Bosses were told fatigue was affecting his driving. On the day of the accident, Kalish Chanda had already worked a 75-hour week. He was deemed unfit to stand trial at a previous hearing. The bus company, which pleaded guilty to two health and safety offences, admitted their failure to act had tragic consequences. Our own detail policies were not followed as closely as they should have been. There were failures at an operational level in driver supervision, and we deeply regret the opportunities that were missed to act decisively on emerging warning signs. In a statement, the Fitzgerald family said their lives have been changed forever. We will always feel anger over the cruel and unnecessary way Rowan died. Anger at not only the driver, Kailesh Chanda, but also the bus company, which we feel did not do enough 
to stop the driver being a danger to others. Midland Red says it has made key changes and now has much more robust safety measures in place. But the judge said the £2.3 million fine reflects the fact that the public was put at risk not just on that day, but for months beforehand. Catherine Stancheshin, BBC News, Birmingham. The British academic freed from jail in the United Arab Emirates yesterday has arrived back in Britain. Matthew Hedges was welcomed home by his wife and members of his family. The Durham University PhD student was pardoned yesterday after being sentenced to life in prison for spying. And this afternoon, his wife, Daniela Tahada, has tweeted this picture of the couple reunited after his return. She said, thanks for collectively helping me to bring back my husband. We've been through hell and back and would really appreciate having some space to catch up on much needed rest. A police watchdog says a crisis in mental health services is putting an intolerable burden on police in England and Wales. The Inspectorate of Constabulary claims officers are being forced to respond to tens of thousands of incidents every year which should be handled by mental health specialists. Our Home Affairs correspondent Danny Shaw reports. He was a talented musician, but for many years, Sean Rigg suffered from severe mental health problems, paranoid schizophrenia. In August 2008, he was arrested and restrained by police after reports he'd attacked people. The 40-year-old was taken to a police station, but he collapsed and died in hospital. An inquest jury said police had used an unnecessary and unsuitable level of force. What we need is care when somebody's been restrained, somebody's vulnerable, the excessive force that's been used. That, that shouldn't happen. We are where we are. Police are involved in, in this. The watchdog that monitors police in England and Wales says they should be far less involved in cases like this. In a report, it says officers are picking up the pieces because the mental health system is broken. The report says when mental health patients need help, 50% of the trips to hospital or a safe place are made by police, not ambulance. It takes about three hours for police to deal with someone who's mentally unwell. In London, five people with mental health problems called police 8,600 times last year, more than anyone else. The police are called to step in out of hours when other services go home. So we see uh, the volume of calls to police peaking at around four or five o'clock. in the evening weekdays when other practitioners are going home and we see that as uh, other mental health services pushing the risk and demand onto the police just because they're a 24-7 service. Police leaders have welcomed the inspection report. They say the health service must stop passing the buck. This report must now put a full stop to everything that we've said before. Uh, there is a crisis, it needs to be dealt with and there needs to be some action. So okay. I completely support what's been said. The government says it's planning to spend an extra £2 billion a year on mental health services in England and has already reduced the use of police custody for those in need. Danny Shaw, BBC News. You're watching Afternoon Live. These are our headlines. Theresa May tours the nations trying to rally public support for her Brexit deal as it's criticised by allies at home and abroad. A bus company has fined more than £2 million for ignoring warnings about a driver who later killed two people. 18 migrants, including a toddler, are rescued from two small boats in the English Channel. And in sport, Jose Mourinho promises that he will walk to Old Trafford for their Champions League match against Young Boys if needed tonight. Their two home games so far have been delayed because of traffic problems. Win tonight and they could be through to the knockout stage. The second leg of the Copa Libertadores final will not be held in Argentina, but it will be held on either the 8th or 9th of December at a venue to be announced. And former England defender Sol Campbell has his first manager's job. He's taken over at the league's bottom side, Macclesfield Town. I'll have more on those stories just after half, half past four for you. Now, scientists at NASA say they're beginning to gather data from Mars after successfully landing a probe on the surface of the planet yesterday. The InSight spacecraft has already begun to send its first images back. Our science reporter Victoria Gill sent this report from Mission Control in California. Touchdown confirmed. 
relief and joy at mission control. After plunging through the Martian atmosphere at six times the speed of a bullet, NASA's InSight spacecraft safely planted its feet on the surface of Mars. Now the science begins. It's going to be a really busy uh, two or three months for us. I'm really hoping that the energy I'm feeling today is going to carry me through those, uh, those next few months because it's going to be needed. Uh, but, you know, the first, when we get our first Mars quake, we're going to get a bunch of images over the next few days. And it's just incredible to be on this mission and to say, now tomorrow when I come on shift, I'm going to see an image of Mars that no one has ever seen before. And it's already sending snapshots back to Earth. InSight's cameras will examine its surroundings in detail so scientists can select exactly where to place its scientific equipment. It'll listen for Martian earthquakes and drill deep into the planet to study its inner structure. As the InSight lander studies the deep interior of Mars robotically, it'll be sending its data back here to Mission Control at NASA in California. And the people here will use that data to work out exactly how rocky worlds like Earth, Mars and the Moon actually formed four and a half billion years ago. They lovingly call this the center of the universe. The two-year mission is now underway. The hidden depths of the red planet. Victoria Gill, BBC News at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California. Joining me now, Dr. Ren Urshad, a researcher at the Science and Technology Facilities Council who worked on the NASA Mars InSight mission. And I, I was watching you as we were playing that report, and the moment it landed and the relief on the faces of the people in the, in the mission control, uh, you must have shared that experience completely, because you've been working on this for 10 years yourself, haven't you? That's right. It was incredibly exciting. There was a moment just before landing where there was a pause that went on just a little <laughs> bit longer than we were anticipating. <laughs> and there is a worry, there's a thought that runs through your head that says, oh, perhaps it didn't make it. But it did, and there was so much excitement, people were punching the air. Now, uh, we've already had the first images, and they, they do look amazing. They're absolutely fabulous. So the first one is the immediate snapshot with a wide-angle lens. It still has the dust cap on the cover, so it's quite spotty, but it lets you know that you've gotten there and it's safe. And then the second one is just so crisp. It's incredibly clear, and it allows you to see that you're absolutely on another world. Yeah, I, I mean, they are amazing, and NASA was, was tweeting them out a little earlier. We, we, we've been showing them here this afternoon. And I, Let's just talk about what you now want to happen next because you've got equipment on board which is going to be looking inside the planet because you think that there, there may be earthquakes going on there. That's right. So I was part of the UK team. The UK instrument is a miniature seismometer that's incredibly sensitive. In the next few weeks, the lander is going to determine exactly where on the surface to place that seismometer. And once it's there, we're going to be feeling the first vibrations that anyone has ever felt on the surface of another planet. We're hoping that we'll be able to sense Mars quakes and ideally impacts from meteorites as well. We don't know what the structure of Mars is. So those vibrations might be coming from shifts in tectonic plates or more likely in stresses and pressures in the crust, the top surface of the planet. But we'll absolutely feel vibrations coming from meteorite impacts all over the planet. And each one illuminates the inside of the planet for us. The so it's like when you walk into a dark room and turn on a light bulb. The light from that bulb travels through the room, hits your eyes, and allows you to see everything that's happening inside it. With each vibration that hits that planet, the vibrations will travel through the planet to our sensors and allow us for the first time to see just what's going on inside Mars. You must always be concerned that the equipment doesn't fail. I mean, it's not like you can ring curries and get them to go and sort it out. I mean, what do you do to ensure... not hesitate. And <laughs> really, I mean, what would you want to... What's, what are the things that you want answered, the questions that you have? There are a vast range of questions about the universe. The one that everyone wants to know is, is there life outside of the Earth? And we suspect that... There isn't life on the surface of Mars, but we may well find it below the surface. So Mars at one stage had a magnetic field, which would have been, on Earth, it's the result of movements in a molten iron core. That's one of the things we want to measure with the instruments that we have. That magnetic field is what holds our atmosphere in place. So it 
It allows that atmosphere to keep us warm. It protects us from the radiation from the sun. It gives us lovely warm temperatures and liquid water, all of the things that are needed for life to flourish. At some point, Mars lost its atmosphere. It lost the magnetic field that kept it safe, and the solar wind slowly allowed it to drift away, which meant the temperatures on the surface rose, it became bombarded with radiation, and that's why we think we haven't found life on the surface of Mars. But there is still the possibility that that life retreated below the surface. So that's one of the questions we're hoping to answer. Well, do us a favour, don't go, because I, I think we rather need you back here on Earth, uh, at least for the moment. Uh, it's great to talk to you. <laughs> Dr. Rain Ishad, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. You're watching Afternoon Live from BBC News. Now, two boats carrying a total of 18 migrants, including an 18-month-old child, have been stopped in the English Channel. They're the latest of more than 100 people have been picked up trying to cross to the UK. Simon Jones reports now from Dover. In the middle of the Channel, in the cold and the dark, nine migrants, some children, found on a tiny boat. Despite repeated warnings on both sides of the Channel that people are putting their lives at risk trying to cross the in the world, it's continuing. The migrants were brought to Dover. Well, it's unprecedented what is happening at the moment. And it's like crossing the M25 on foot during the rush hour. It is the busiest thoroughfare for shipping in the world. There's over 400 commercial shipping movements a day. They do not have lighting. They do not have experience. They've got an inadequate boat. They're very, very lucky to be alive. The French authorities rescued another nine migrants on a fishing boat in the early hours. The Dover lifeboat was involved in one of this morning's rescue operations and down there beside it you can see just how small the boat on which nine migrants were found actually is, risking their lives in the cold and the dark. Over the past month more than 100 migrants have succeeded getting across the channel in small boats. Most have claimed to be from Iran. It's thought many have flown into Serbia after the country began offering visa-free access to Iranians to boost tourism and trade then heading to northern France with the goal of getting to the south coast. What we need to see is we need to see the Home Office and the French authorities working together to find these people traffickers who are behind this and stop them in their tracks before there's a tragedy in the middle of the English Channel. The Home Office says border force patrols have been stepped up, but some are warning that if this continues, the rescue operations could turn into the recovery of bodies. Simon Jones, BBC News, Dover. Now, let's have a look at the weather. Chris Fawkes is here in the studio, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about what's happening here in just a moment. But in certain parts of Europe, it's, uh, well, it's pretty miserable and gloomy all the time. <laughs> well, yes, we're looking at the length of day, and yeah, looking outside of the windows here at the moment, it's already gone dark in London. We're losing about two hours, 15 minutes each day, or thereabouts. Uh, but imagine what it's like in Norway, where yesterday the day length was an hour and ten in Tromso within the Arctic Circle. Today, they had just 28 minutes of uh, daylight. Uh, so that is between when the sun's up above the horizon when it sets. And that was today? Uh, yeah, this was it. This was uh, just 15 minutes before the sun went down below the horizon. Yeah, it's a pretty grey kind of day with some snow around as well. But the sun's now below the horizon, and it's not going to come up again until the 15th of January. So 48 straight solid days have just been dark, and it'll get darker and darker, of course, until we get yeah, to Yeah, I've had a lot of tweets saying it doesn't go black dark. It, it has a very, very well, a surreal feel to it. It's almost yellow, the sky. That's right. You can get, uh, for a time, you can get uh, civil twilight, which is where the sun's just... Civil dipped, twilight? Civil twilight, yeah. Evening civil twilight, morning civil twilight. It's where the sun's just dipped below the horizon, but it's still throwing up a little bit of light into the atmosphere, so it's not completely dark. However, if you go further north to the North Pole, it is completely dark, so there is that kind of gradation. Thankfully, we don't get that, but our days are getting shorter all the while. Yeah, it does feel pretty dark outside, doesn't it? It does, and we're in for something of a change, are we? Yes, that's right. So we've had our spell of quite chilly air over the last few days, uh, but the weather is on the turn. We're seeing uh, weather systems move in off the Atlantic, and uh, it's these that are bringing the change in our weather patterns. So 
If we dive underneath the cloud, well, today's temperatures for some hovering around about six or seven degrees Celsius. But as we get those southwesterly winds flowing in across the country, you can just see how those temperatures rise. And for some, 14, 15 degrees Celsius tomorrow is going to feel like a completely different day. And that kind of change with the weather has been taking place through the day today. We've seen this band of rain push in. And as the rain's cleared across Wales and southwest England, that's the, where the milder air is. So, through this evening, wet weather for eastern parts of England and eastern Scotland. Dry for a time with a risk of some mist and fog patches. The next batch of rain then moves in. And look at the temperatures overnight. Nowhere near as cold as it has been in recent nights and pretty mild towards the south. Southwest with temperatures no lower than 10 in Plymouth. Now, for tomorrow's weather forecast, we've got this big area of low pressure, tightly packed isobars targeting the UK with a swathe of strong winds, first of all running up the western side of England and Wales. Gusts here could reach around 60, maybe 70 miles an hour. And then we get a second pulse of strong winds close to Northern Ireland and working into Scotland as we head towards Wednesday evening time. Again, we could see local gusts up to 60, maybe 70 miles an hour. So they are strong enough to bring. Some big branches being brought down off trees, maybe a few uh, power cuts and uh, transport likely to be affected. And then there's the rain too. We're all going to get some of that, but the rain's going to be heaviest for Northern Ireland and Northern Scotland where some localised surface water flooding is a possibility. Now the weather doesn't get any more settled for Thursday. Low pressure is still with us and this little low that's working into the western side of the UK, there's still some uncertainty about how strong that low pressure is going to be. The worst case scenario is that we could get even stronger winds, maybe 70 or 80 miles an hour running up the western side of England and Wales. But uh, that is open to some uncertainty. What we are more sure about is it's going to be a windy kind of day. 50 to 60, probably more typical values with rain at times, some sunny spells, and it stays on the mild side. And in fact, that uh, run of mild weather is set to continue as we head towards the end of the week and the weekend. But often there'll be rain at times. Some of it will be pretty heavy and pretty persistent as well. And temperatures staying into double figures for most of us. But across the north of Scotland, at times, we'll see incursions of slightly cooler air. So temperatures a little closer to average for the time of year, and at times perhaps turning a little bit cool as we head through the weekend. That's your latest weather. Sometimes being in the driving seat is... She stayed in school. She's a... This isn't just playing sport. This is... The simple act of standing and you're a... You don't need superpowers to change the world. 100 women... A season of inspiring and challenging stories across the BBC. This is BBC News, our latest headlines. Theresa May tours the nations trying to rally public support for her Brexit deal as it's criticised by allies at home and abroad. A bus company is fined £2.3 million for ignoring warnings about a driver who later killed two people in a crash in 2015. 18 migrants, including a toddler, are rescued from two small boats in the English Channel. Matthew Hedges, the British academic released from jail in the United Arab Emirates, returns home and thanks his wife for helping win his freedom. And NASA's probe on Mars has started sending images back to Earth after it successfully made landfall last night. Sport now on Afternoon Live with Hugh Ferris and we're talking Champions League. Both Manchester clubs. Now on Afternoon Live, let's go nationwide, see what's happening around the country in our daily visit to the BBC newsrooms around the UK. Peter Levy, there he is. He's in Hull. Uh, where Look North have been looking at the introduction of groundbreaking 3D printing technology. It's being used to reconstruct patients' skulls and has had amazing results. We'll be with you in just a moment, Peter. And Susan, Norwich studio there, look east. Look, following that heartwarming story we've been looking at today, the local bone marrow donor and the young boy whose life he saved. It is a great story. We'll be with you very shortly, Susie. But first of all, Peter Levy, tell us about this printer. Yes, hospital scientists at Castle Hill Hospital near Hull are using the latest technology. It's a 3D printer. It can help people born with complex facial deformities, cancer patients, or after a serious facial injury. It's being seen as a huge breakthrough. Now, the patient has a CT scan. It produces a 3D image on a computer screen, which the scientists overlay with mirror images to look at the extent of the damage from both the inside and the outside of the skull. This makes it easier and quicker for them to work 
work out what sort of implants are needed to help rebuild the patient's face. It's better for the patients and saves the NHS money by reducing the time for each person. It's amazing work, Simon. It really is what they can do at the moment. And, and it really does change lives. Yes, I mean, th the main thing is speed is important to the patients. This 3D printer can have the model made in hours cost just £10 for each model and they can do it there and then, they don't have to send away as has been the case before. The 3D model is 100% accurate. The East Yorkshire Hospitals Trust is the, one of the first in the country to use 3D printing in this way. It's good for the patients because of the speed. Often these things, as you can well understand, Simon, can be very disfiguring and distressing for the patients. This means that the patients endure less psycholo like, psychological damage and can to work and their lives uh, more quickly at what is a very difficult and anxious time for them. Now, Robin Hodkinson broke every bone in his face, if you can believe that, in a cycling accident in Beverly. His injuries were so horrific, he wasn't allowed to look in a mirror until after his surgery. This is Robin. Those plates involved, you know, my eyes, my nose, my mouth. Uh, and I think about my functions today, you know, I can eat, I can speak, I can see, I can breathe, um, you know, it, it, it just brings it all home. It is extraordinary, it's a good news story, uh, Simon, for the patients in, uh, in every way, extraordinary work. Yeah, fabulous, and you've got more on that, 6.30? We have more at half past six as usual. Peter, thank you very much. Now, another heartwarming story, and I mean, you need a box of tissues for this one, don't you, Susie? Because this is, uh, tell us about Rupert and, and his condition, first of all, this, how it all started. Well, Rupert Cross, Simon, was just five when he was diagnosed with a rare blood disorder. It's called myelodysplasia monosomy 7. It affected his immune system and he became very ill. He spent months having chemotherapy. Doctors said it would develop into leukemia. Look at him, poor little chap. What he needed was a stem cell transplant, but that depended on finding a bone marrow donor that was a match for him. Now, it's worth noting that around 2,000 people in the UK need a stem cell transplant from a stranger every year, but only 2% of the population are on the bone marrow register. So you can imagine it was agony for his family to see him suffering and not be able to help him. That first week, you know, he had lines put in to have the, you know, the chemo through, and it is horrible to see. Um, I remember the time when his hair was falling out and I was in with a nurse and I was just stroking his hair um, and it was just coming out in clumps and it wasn't until later on that day and he saw his reflection in the bath um, and the tap he could see his reflection and he went my hair's gone I would have done anything to have swapped places with him yeah. It's, it's, it's such, it's such a horrific experience. If you've got a lump in your throat at home, you're not alone, let me tell you. Uh, now, there, the, the amazing bit of this, because little did they know, there was a young man in Basildon who was about to become a lifesaver. Yes, Billy Higgins. He works in a bank and one day outside his office there was an opportunity to be tested to go on the bone marrow register. And that apparently just involves a mouth swab. Well, Billy, by his own admission, joined the queue as there was a girl he liked in it. <laughs> he was tested and shortly afterwards he was told he was a match for someone. Now, he had to have a lumbar puncture, so enough bone marrow could be removed for Rupert. It all went according to plan. Rupert was given his stem cells and has made a full recovery. And four years on, Billy was able to meet the Cross family for the first time. It was very emotional. Rupert's parents called him amazing, a, a lifesaver. Rupert himself describes Billy as his superman. And Simon, I have to say, there wasn't a dry eye in our newsroom when this story was run today. It's just so moving to see how one man's act of kindness can make such a huge difference. And it all turned out well for Billy, too, as he ended up marrying that girl he fancied in the queue. That's a little tear in your eye, I can see. <laughs>
I, I can watch that and I cry every time. I've seen it many times now. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, You're not alone. No. I, you really aren't. It's Terribly a fabulous moving. story and plenty more I know on your programme at 6.30 as well on that. And thank you for bringing us that. Uh, it, it's a fabulous story. Peter, also some positive news. What a great nationwide. Thank you both very much. And if you would like to see more on any of those stories, you can access them via the BBC iPlayer. And a reminder, we go nationwide every weekday afternoon at 4.30 here on Afternoon Live. Now, a health think tank is warning that thousands of cancer patients are dying unnecessarily each year because NHS England has failed to improve care quickly enough. A study by the Health Foundation found England had failed to close the gap with countries that perform better, such as Canada. Our health correspondent Nick Triggle reports. Over the last 20 years, there have been four national cancer strategies. Each has promised the best care for England. But the Health Foundation said while there had been progress, the NHS was still lagging behind. Its analysis shows that only on breast cancer has the health service managed to actually close the gap with the best performing systems. The report warns the lack of progress is costing lives. Each year, 135,000 people die from cancer. But 10,000 of those could be prevented if care was as good as in other nations. The key problem is one of late diagnosis. People who are diagnosed late have a much less good chance of surviving five years than those who are diagnosed early. Um, and, and so we have got to make it easier for patients to access their GP, for GPs to investigate and refer on, for diagnostic services to be there uh, so that people can be diagnosed in a rapid way. The think tank wants to see better access to tests and scans to speed up diagnosis, but it said services were being undermined by a lack of staff and equipment, which is delaying how quickly patients are seen. The government has already said it aims to tackle this. Last month, the Prime Minister promised the number of cancers being diagnosed early would increase from one in two to three in four over the next ten years, thanks to the extra funding being provided to the health service. The Department of Health and Social Care said more details would be unveiled in the long-term plan for the NHS, which is expected to be published soon. Nick Triggle, BBC News. Mariam has returned, which is That's a surprise fair. to me, but there we are. Uh, she'll bring us all the business news in just a moment. But first, our headlines here on Afternoon Live. Theresa May tours the nations trying to rally public support for her Brexit deal as it's criticised by allies at home and abroad. A bus company has fined more than £2 million for ignoring warnings about a driver who killed two people. Eighteen migrants, including a toddler, are rescued from two small boats in the English Channel.